This is my friend John. John thinks he's so good at chess. Yeah, I was part of a chess team. It's something you actually have to have skill to make. And try as I might, over the last 15 years of our friendship, not once have I ever beaten him at a game of chess. Wait, okay, okay, be honest. Were you trying at all there? Okay, best two out of three. <laughs> but all that is about to change. This is the story of how I took 10 days of my life and studied some of the best chess strategies. That's it, you, you solved chess. Slowly lost my sanity. <laughs> and ultimately resorted to unbelievable lengths. I did look through John's games. I found one way in which he might fall for the trick. To become a chess master and beat my friend, John. Chapter one, opening moves. Now, in order to understand this story in its entirety, you need to know a couple of very important things first. And it's a little bit longer, but I promise, if you stick with me, it's well worth it. The first thing you need to know is, I don't play chess. You know, I, I know how the knight moves. I know the world champion just lost to Heinrich von Nutcracker when he had a pawn up his sleeve. And I know to be good, you have to move the pieces like a complete crackhead. But other than that, I'm brand new to chess. So naturally, anyone's next question should be, why? Why take up this challenge at all? And to answer that, you need to know about my buddy, John. Now, for whatever reason, John doesn't want me to use his photo in this video. I wonder why. <laughs> It's always gonna look like this whenever he shows up. Now, a few weeks ago, John, myself, and a few of our friends were up north at a cottage. Next thing I know, someone breaks out a chessboard, and I'm across the table from John. Absolute hell on earth. He might be one of my best friends, but I hate this man. Now, I obviously wasn't recording these over the board games, but I've gone ahead and made a full reenactment of how they went. Yeah, to say the least, I did not win against him. Anyway, to do this challenge right, I needed a control game against him where I could have some actual statistics and insight to see if I improved over my 10 days playing chess. So I voluntarily ruined my entire day and gave John a call. John? Brother. Can I play you in chess? Sure, so uh, your heart desires. Uh, don't sound too enthusiastic now. This is what I'm working with here. I fucking hate this son of a- Anyways, we set up a quick 10 minute game and John got to kick it off. Right off the rip, he hits me with an absolutely devastating move. Queen's pawn to e4. Oh, no way! Oh my gosh! Oh my I didn't have any other choice but to hit him back with my own queen pawn. Are you kidding me? I was playing to win. And in John's words- All right, ever cooking, ever cooking. And a few more moves went by. I moved my knights out to cover my pawns. They say the naked man fears no pickpocket, but I wasn't taking any chances. See, I'm covered. I'm fully covered now, John. Uh-huh. This guy, it's like talking to a brick wall, I swear to God. Anyways, it was time to make some moves and go on to the attack. What do you think of that? It's a good one. 
Oh, I'm, I'm scared now. <laughs> and I was kind of playing like it. I am so scared. Next, I hid my king in the corner, and John would hit me with this. I've not seen enough movement, as Ninja would say. Ninja? Oh, okay. <laughs> I've not seen enough movement. Jeez, considering how many memes I've already put in here, that was kind of embarrassing. Anyways, John continued to probe and attack my left flank here. Let's just open the board up a bit. Let's just get out. Uh, okay. I think I can kill him with- You're like, hmm, gee willikers. Maybe this move will stump John. And then like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to narrate here. It's going to be super boring if they're watching. There's, <laughs> there's nothing going on. Like, what do you want me to do? Right, right. Interesting. This is very inter. And as the game progressed, I would try and open up an attack on the right side, as he kept picking me apart and rubbing it in. Huh. It seems my friend John. <laughs> I'm up on time, but I'm down. <laughs> I had to focus up, because with a few good moves, I could swing this game back in my favor. Um, yeah, I'm like, I'm running around. Oh. Oh. Am I actually toast right now? Okay, okay. I'm good, I'm good. Uh-huh. Right. But yeah, I may as well. Is that what you, is, is, is that, is that, is that helpful for you? Is that, is that? Uh, yes. Little did he know, I was building towards my master plan. Okay. Interesting. I had him on the ropes. A few more turns, and he was cornered. Interesting. <laughs> I had lost to John. And that laughter... <laughs> it rings in my ears. I can't close my eyes without hearing it over and over and over. Be honest, were you trying at all there? I had to be gracious in my defeat, for in ten days I'd face this man one more time. Would you be amazed if I got anybody in particular to coach me? Russian Grandmaster Kasparov? <laughs> Oh yeah, look look up Bia Hirong chess coach. Who's that? Six year old Pinoy chess wizard. <laughs>So by now, this should be very clear to you. This isn't a story about two chess titans battling it out on the world stage, but the dramatic tale of two low elo legends playing for the highest stakes in existence, bragging rights amongst friends, and the title of greatest chess player to ever exist. And to win it, I had a plan. I needed to start by getting acquainted with competitive chess. Hello. Sure, I had played a few games before, but nothing serious. Naturally, I asked some friends, what's the first thing I can do? You're trying to master chess next? Yeah. Google on passant. En passant. Oh, this could be good. My next move, naturally, was YouTube. I found this guy who had documented his journey. Ah, uh, I know where you're looking, not there. Th this guy. They come back later in the video, I, I promise. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> that is so not funny. And he showed that he did a bunch of puzzles every day, studied some tactics, and perfected some openings, which was an excellent framework to get started with. So I began looking at some tactics. And here's the three basic ones that everybody should learn right off the rip. And I'll let the experts explain this, but tactics are essentially... It's a sequence of moves that force your opponent to do something that benefits you. Now, there's the skewer. So let's look at this position. You see how it's putting black in check? So it's forcing black to move his king because he has to get out of check. And when he moves, you capture the queen. Next, you have the spork. One piece is going to attack two pieces at the same time. Not unlike a fork you would use to flip a steak on a grill. And finally, there's pins. So in this position, white can move their rook to d2, lining up with the queen and the king. Ideally, black would like to move their queen away. 
but if they try to do that, that's an illegal move because their king would be under attack. So now I knew about these tactics, the tough part would be putting them into practice. Next, I worked on some puzzles like the guy said. And not to brag, but I was pretty good at those. Yeah, I'm pretty good at puzzles. Finally, I looked at some openings. Now I searched up best chess openings, and I found this video for the Ponziani opening. And I was gonna try it out against Quebec's most famous player, Felix. The stakes were high for this week, but could I start by winning against a bot? I was a few moves away from finding out because this would be my introduction to taking chess seriously. Okay, first move, pawn to e4. Next, pawn to c3. Then I th think you put the king in check. Now you develop your knights. Fuck. So the truth of the matter is, I watched about five minutes of a 30 minute video, got all excited, went to go try it out, and immediately forgot everything I learned. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I got confused by this part here right before I stopped watching. And the point is that if they ever take this pawn, you have attack on the knight, knight moves, queen a4 is a fork. So I would have to go back to the video, try it out, Ugh. go back to the video, try it out again, and do that over and over and over again. It was hard work, but I knew I had to do it. There was nothing more important than beating John. Why, you might ask? Well, that's because I knew since the first time we met, this man had to be defeated. September 23rd, 2009. We met on the basketball court. Lunchtime basketball was absolute pandemonium. Three games on each hoop, dozens of kids per game. It was inevitable. People would bump into each other and tempers would rise. And on this fateful day, John would start fighting and yelling and kicking and screaming with somebody. I watched this man yander over to someone with a repaired cleft lip and utter the words, you better watch yourself or I'll staple that lip right back to your fucking nose. If anyone could justify a sentence like that to somebody with a deformity, I'd be amazed. This man needed to be stopped at all costs. So I worked hard all evening, putting hours into learning how to study chess. And after encountering defeat after defeat after defeat from XQC, I knew the only real way to measure progress was to play online against other real humans. Chapter 2 is called Sacrifice, and this one, well, it's a bit of a doozy. So I started my second day by putting into practice those openings I had studied the night before. I had my elo of 478, and I needed to defend it. Now, in terms of a black opening, I had learned the Karokan defense. At its most basic, the opening starts with pawns on c6 and d5. Then you're supposed to move your bishop out so that he's active. Then you add this guy on e6. And in theory, you have a better pawn structure than your opponent with an active bishop and the rest of your pieces ready to be developed. This opening is super simple for how powerful it is, and literally anyone can apply it. And and that's exactly how we started. Mr. AB up here would trade our minor pieces, that's the name for the knights and the bishop, worth three points each, and I would eat them back with my pawn here, opening up the G file for the all important Rock! And after developing some more pieces, we wound up at this position. Now this man absolutely blunders his knight here. I take it and I'm up material and positioning. So I decide to exchange some more pieces. I had watched a YouTube tips video on that. Now that I'm up so much material, what I really want to do is that I want to exchange as many pieces as possible. See, I even used the term material correctly. I was getting better. And after exchanging those pieces, I had them on the ropes. All I would have to do was make a small sacrifice. Daruk. And if I did that, a checkmate would be inevitable. And I would have them done and dusted with seven minutes to spare. But the all important question was, did. I. See it. No, I didn't see it. I would block off my own g-file, get completely scared, pin my own queen, and lose the game. Mother. Chalk that up under things you love to see, Derek. But I have to say, overall, my night wouldn't be so bad. You know, I implemented these openings well, and would win a few, I'd lose a few, 
and I learned a few good lessons in the process. Like in this case, I had him literally dead to enter, up by 26 points with five minutes left. He can't use this, he can't use this. What the fuck? Stalemate happens when a player has no legal move and the king is not in check. How the hell was I supposed to know that? Regardless, I would finish the night by putting on an absolute masterclass of a win. Uh, do we want to move e pawn? Or oh, we, we do d pawn. I won! He just fucking. <laughs> He <laughs> just gave up on the first move. <laughs> yes, I love that. Achieving my new ELO high of 481. Made one move and it gave me 21 points. This was unbelievable. I could not have asked for a better first day. I only had a 300 ELO gap to close on John, and I had a plan on exactly how to do that. I woke up on day three with an unbridled enthusiasm for this beautiful game. So naturally, I put in my mom's credit card to chess.com and unlocked all the premium features, including their reviews, which would be helpful, and unlimited puzzles. I was still feeling on fire from yesterday and was gonna ride this wave of easy elo as long as I could. I started the day ripping some training, and every time I would fail, oh my god, okay, I got six. I feel like you can't get any worse than that. I would get back up. Let's go! And when my skills were sharp enough, I'd start against bots, playing, and later analyzing exactly where I went wrong and what I could do better. And on white, I had switched my opening to practicing the London system, which we'll talk about later. Now, many deep in the Ottawa lore might know this already, but I am not merely a man. I'm a man being controlled by a small rodent inside my brain. Yeah, a little hamster with plethora of buttons and levers he uses to control me. In my days, today he was pressing all the right buttons. I was sharp, tactical, and killing it. So after a few hours of training against bots, I felt confident I didn't even have to enact my new plan. I would jump right back into competitive. I was trained up and ready. And with all that work done, would it pay off? With win after win after win, I was tearing it up. I felt unstoppable. I would climb as high as 554 throughout the day, and the little hamster was living his best life. Now, I would end my day hovering around that elo, and let's not kid ourselves here. I was getting better, but I had plateaued. I literally had the mate, and I didn't, didn't use it. I'm shit. But I told myself, tomorrow I would enact my plan and finally close that gap on John. The pursuit of passion often involves sacrifice. And it's in this pursuit where your hero is always at odds with the villain. In high school, I would find my passion in volunteering to film the school football games. And it was a lot of work, hauling equipment, recording, editing, all so that the team would have game film to review. But I sacrificed so I could pursue my passion. So I could use the school's media room, cameras, learn their editing software. And most importantly, I sacrificed for those five glorious moments at the end of every year, where I would make this highlight video, and it would be shown to the team at the end of year party. And it was in those fleeting moments where they would stop calling me the camera bitch, and it would all feel worth it. It felt like I had a purpose. But the next day, the cycle would repeat, and we would resume our constant state of struggle once again. Now, chess was merely an extension of the struggle, with the same man at the opposite end of the table. So this challenge was important, and because of that, I reached out to every chess coach and YouTuber I could find looking for help. I even reached out to that six-year-old Russian grandmaster John was talking about, and it wouldn't be long until I got some unbelievable results. Now, while I waited, I started day four by watching videos. I wanted to pick up as many easy tips and tricks as possible. Luckily, for my ELO, they tend to reuse a lot of the same tricks. Here's an example. So first things first, when your opponent makes a move, what should you ask yourself? You should ask, what does that move do? Which is reiterated here. The thought process should basically be, is my opponent creating a threat? And a few dozen more times in other videos. Some of these tips even gave me the feeling that I had a chance to close that gap today. Like, what does that mean, improve my position, when, when I say that? What does that... It means... 
like get get pieces in a position. Yeah, like bro, what the fuck? <laughs> The next reoccurring tip was this one, checks, captures, and attacks. This came up a lot over multiple different creators. The first you have to ask yourself, is my opponent creating a threat? Second, can you put the king in check? If so, is it logical to do that? Can you basically scare them enough into making a mistake? The third is captures. Do I have any captures? Yes, I have this, but that doesn't do anything. And finally, fourth, can you set up an attack like Levy describes here? This move drastically weakens this knight. So the first thing that I'm thinking of in this position is to bring in this bishop because that pins the knight and it's very difficult to defend. Queen to d2, queen to a5, and the game is just over. Now I pondered this principle in this list a lot and I thought if I could apply this in my games, it would bring me to the next level. So without any practice, I jumped right into it. Okay. Here we go. So I would start my game. A typical Caro opening. Jesus, I was starting to sound like the XQC bot. This one's kind of messed up. And I was a little... I think I've already made a mistake. Um. I lack a lot of confidence in this one, but you know, I was doing my checklist. You can go here, you can go here, you can go here. Oh. You can go here. But only after I had made my move? You could tell I was pretty nervous about losing any elo. Two moves later, I would almost resort to old habits. Mm, let's start developing our pieces. But pull out the checklist yet again. Actually, we'll uh, do a little attack here, maybe? And now here's where things start to get a little interesting. In the sense that I completely abandoned the checklist as soon as I got into a position that was a little bit more complex. Shoring up that attack? I guess you should just take this easy. Um, okay, now let's advance a few more moves. I want to put you in my head at this point. I'm in this position, I'm rated 500, and I've been playing chess for four days. I go through the checklist and find a check. Right here, this move puts the king in check. And sure, we'll eventually trade our minor pieces, but it wins a pawn and puts me in a position for a potential checkmate. I was impressed I found this one. So I made it, but he hit me with this. We need to pause here because some moves in chess, some moves are so consequential, so important. One move can change not only the course of a game, but your entire chess career. And for me, that move, well, that move was right here. Okay, he just gave away a checkmate. Yeah. Now a normal person might say, Ottawa, Ottawa, don't worry. This man just blundered his queen. You've got him. But I, I'm not a normal person. And it was here that my entire life would change. He actually just fucked me. He's gonna go up here, take this guy, and then I'm fucked. How am I so shit at fucking chess? <sighs> that fucking sucks, man. I've blundered I don't know how many times. I'm not getting better. Yeah. I might as well just fucking resign because I'm so shit at this fucking game. And it was with that resignation did the hamster disappear. And only with the game review, when I noticed the hanging queen. How? 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 How did I miss that? That was a game. Un fing believable. Did a new character emerge? The squirrel. If the hamster was lawful good, the squirrel was chaotic evil. Running amok in my head, pushing levers that didn't make sense, ripping wires out, putting them in places they didn't belong, pressing all the wrong buttons. And what followed was my slow descent, and not only ELO, but into madness. How am I getting so fucking destroyed? Ah, oh, so I think if I move my queen up here, that's checkmate. 
Oh my god, I'm so fucking bad at this. Oh, I don't have mate. I just fucked myself. It's over. Doesn't matter what I'm trying to learn. I don't have mate, everybody. I'm a big fucking idiot that doesn't have mate. Doesn't matter how much chess I play. Look at this big fucking idiot, everybody. He thinks he's gonna go here. He thinks he's a big fucking hot shot, eh? No, he just lost his queen. What a fuck. Make one mistake and this whole game goes out the window. This, he's gonna attack me here. He's gonna attack me here. I lost my rook. Yeah. Why am I so bad, man? Fucking it. Fuck you. Fucking five points. Oh, I'm just about ready to quit. That evening, I didn't know what to do. I was lost. I wandered the warm Ottawa summer streets and stumbled onto a church. I went inside. Maybe the heavens would have the answers I sought. And as I sat for hours, my mind racing, I couldn't stop thinking about chess. That night I continued walking aimlessly and found myself at a pub. Maybe I could Queen's Gambit my way into beating John. One Gibson Martini, and two of those little mint things, please. Drinking yourself out of a problem there, stranger. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been in a lot of problems in my life. i found there's only two things you can do to get out of them. You can dust yourself off and get back up and keep trying no matter what. Or you pack up all your stuff and move to the prairies, because that one always works for me. And right then is when I realized something. He... he was... He was right. I finished my drink and headed home. Tomorrow was gonna be the day. I would climb right back up in Elo. Day five. With my Elo at a career low of 442, I needed to start fresh and try and recoup some of my losses. I was gonna get up and keep trying, just like that old man said. Naturally, I started by watching some more YouTube. And one tip really stood out to me. Like, literally, they all say the same thing. There's a 99% chance that the reason you lose a chess is because you blunder your pieces. Uh, it's very difficult to improve until you get a handle on blunders, because you're liable to just implode at any moment. Say, at, at your level, the most important thing is to try not to lose pieces. All you guys just hang all your pieces every game. You can never improve. I'll last start making fewer blunders. And in reviewing my games from last night, obviously yesterday did not go well. I had quite a few blunders. I was sure this was my problem, and that I could mitigate my losses by just simply blundering less, and to do that, I followed some tips from this Anna Cramling video. What I really took away from this is that she keeps her pieces nice and tight in the lower half of the board, and that whenever she does make a move, she takes that extra half a sec to think about any possible ways that piece is vulnerable. She also tries to castle as early as possible and hide that king in the corner. I felt confident that today, I wouldn't blunder nearly as often. So after checking my email inbox to find it empty, I jumped right back into games. But I wasn't gonna set the tone like this. This was my redemption arc. This was me coming back, getting up and fighting harder than ever. And I needed music to suit that tone. Now this game opened with your standard caro. I was playing it right by the book. Okay, so he's gonna move. Oh baby, was I firing on all cylinders or what? I wonder what's gonna happen next. Next. I'm gonna move. Woo! You could tell I was primed for a win. But then, in an instant, yet again, everything went downhill when he tried to fried liver me. Now, the fried liver is a pretty insane tactic at low elos, but I'll cover it in depth later. For now, all you need to know is, this Frenchman hits me, a Canadian, but a fake Welshman, with an Italian opening. And I? I... If I move him like this... Ah, oh, I should have moved him up. Yes, I definitely just blundered that piece. And oh boy, did the game devolve quickly from that position. Yeah, so it's been like five seconds and I've already blundered, so that's good. I made all kinds of mistakes this way. Moving pieces back and forth. See, I'm legally blind. Missing forks, missing free pieces. Nope. It was, I've lost this one already and the guy's 400. It was a mess. 
I made one mistake in the intro and the whole thing went downhill. And as time would tick, it got more and more intense. Coming down to the wire, I wouldn't know where to move and- Wow, my position's just so bad. With five seconds left, I lost. And with the hamster still missing without a trace. This loss let the squirrel only tighten his grip on my elo and my mind. Which is where my greatest sacrifice for this video comes into play. The day five slide. I'm fucking real, I can't win a goddamn game to save my life. I, well, I might as well play a four-year-old at this point. Like, I actually, I have no idea why I'm so I think I just forked him, because this is covering. He goes, oh, that's a fucking queen, fuck. Game's already lost, I already blundered my queen, so it doesn't really matter. Oh, I blocked my own development again. I do this all the time. I don't know why I do that either. No, 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 no! Wait, 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 wait! Oh. Blundered. Blundered, blundered, blundered. Blundered. Blundered, 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 blundered. 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 Blundered, blundered, blundered. I do believe he has to blundered it. I don't know why I became German there. He's gonna go here, eat me with his pawn. Beautiful fork. Our fucking knack. Every fucking game I lose. Doesn't matter how bad the other person is. Every fucking game. Do me a favor, please. Get out of here. Ha! Huh. What a dumbass. Ah. Oh. Uh, un, 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 I, 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 I can't even, I can't even, like, actually, like, I actually can't, it doesn't, it, I can't, like, how am I, I don't understand. Uh, I think my brain is melted. Apparently I'm pretty good at chess. Apparently I'm pretty good at chess. Yeah, I love not castling. I love moving one fucking space instead of castling. Just fucking stupid, I think, is what it is. No two ways about it. Play another one. New game. Yeah, fuck it. Resign. Here, let's we'll, we'll try again. Well, let's try again. Let's try a new game. Let's try a new game. Let's try a new game. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is going really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you okay? Do you smell toast or anything? Let's go. Let's run the London system again. That's the best system for beginners. Uh, it works every time, blah, 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 as long as you don't blunder your fucking pieces. Oh, and this, we got a we got fucking pro here. It's gonna take 30 seconds to make a goddamn move. Every fucking chance they get. Oh, actually, if I move my queen here and here and here and here, I can actually and I can take his king. Shut the fuck up, Tab. Back later. He's unguarded, right? So in theory, if I do this, so if I go here, that's a free pawn and a check. Should be able to hit him with a. No, oh, no, it's not. I am. Amazing at chess. I can't win a single fucking game. It doesn't make any sense. I'm studying. I'm fucking practicing. I'm trying. A six-year-old in India. I can't fucking beat him. I'm so shit. I'm so fucking shit at this fucking game. Nine. Nine fucking blunders. Nine. Nine. Nine fucking blunders. Nine. 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 I'm playing like a 200. This is unfucking real. Every fucking day I play this, I get fucking worse. Good news! Good news! I'm a fucking 200. <laughs> and it was after that keyboard smash, my recording software stopped. And the only other recording I have from that day is this clip from hours later with no audio. At an ELO of 188, 
Having made one simple minor error, I resigned. A broken shell of a human playing on tilt. And that closes out chapter two. How would I ever come back from this? Chapter three, adjournment. Day six and seven would lead to one of the most interesting times in my life. I wasn't playing chess on tilt. Hell, I wasn't even playing chess for fun anymore. It was a chore. It was just a grind to get my elo back, to work on this video, to beat John. And it was around this time that other parts of my life weren't going so great. You know, my email inbox was pretty much empty. Only one of the 50 people I had emailed replied, and he wanted like $300 to appear in a video. I didn't have that. I also had drug dealers decide they were gonna set up shop right outside my window. And every time I left my shitty apartment that I could barely afford, I had to walk through people smoking crap. On top of that, my day job made me feel like I was wasting my life. As each monotonous day bled into the next. I felt trapped behind a screen with no sense of purpose or fulfillment. And as I sat in this void, questioning the essence of my own existence, the last thing I valued in this world, my YouTube channel was doing worse than ever, fading more and more into nothing every day I wouldn't post. And I was constantly wondering, would I ever reach my subscriber goal for this channel? Or was it dead after two years of hard work and dedication? And it went on like this for months. I stopped playing chess. I stopped the challenge with three days to go. I, I packed it in. I figured I'd never beat John. Until one day. Hey man, sorry for the late reply. I'd love to help you out. I think in a small match, one or two games, you might be able to beat him with some luck. Happy to hear how your thoughts tie in with my own. Was this email the catalyst I needed? You know, they say no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he is not the same man. Who was this figure? Could they help be my savior and train me for the remaining three days to beat John? There is only one way to find out. To rise from the ashes. And I was gonna try it. Chapter 4. Endgames. So, I currently had an elo of 446. I basically played day 5 and 6 too depressed to go on tilt, but was able to slowly grind back my elo to a respectable level. And after I got that email from the coach months later, I was excited about chess again. I had hope. So that day, I went out to the local chess store and actually bought a chessboard. I invited my friend over to play, and even though I literally lost to him every game, he taught me a bunch, like what posture to use when playing chess, that I should expect at least one more DLC before they release Chess 2, and that it'll probably be based on a battle pass. Christ, these developers are even greedier than EA. He also taught me about the fried liver attack, which is awesome at low elos. Now for this attack, you start off as white, pop out E4, then you get your horse out there and your bishop, and bada bing bada boom, you got an Italian opening set up, eh? <laughs> the fuck am I doing in my life? And from there, it's all about putting pressure on the F7 square. You could picture this like a big bowl of spaghetti. Is it true that the Chinese invented spaghetti? Why would people who eat with sticks invent something that you need a fork to eat? All you gotta do, get your knight in there, <laughs> and you got a beautiful spork in your spaghetti. Ak has no option but to manja with the king. Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. And now you got their king running around. You get the maron out to play. At bibbidi bobbidi boop, game's yours. Capiche? <clears throat> so now that I had that in my arsenal, I thought it might just work. And maybe, just maybe, with a little bit of guidance, I could become a better player. And who better to help me than three-time Irish chess champion, Alex Astania. Now he's an international master with a peak rating of 2,468. He was born in Spain and grew up in Ireland. 
So not only could he do the voiceover in this video better than me, but hell, he could give Arteta a run for his money if Arsenal fans ever found out about him. Now, he's got extensive coaching experience and has spent years training at both junior and senior levels. You can find him on YouTube, he's currently taking a little break, because he's actually writing a book on positional chess. And on top of that, he holds a law degree, making us both lawyers. I didn't really go to school for it myself so much as I act as my own from time to time as the needs arise. So after explaining to him my situation, we met up and this man came prepared to annihilate John. All right, so I just spent the last while looking at the mammoth task in front of us. Large Gino is indeed pretty large. He's pretty solid, actually, to be fair. Um, I mean, you can tell he's put in a bit of research into his chess game, right? He's kind of honed his craft. God, he better not find out that you said that. We won't be able to get through the door, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We had close to a three hour meeting, but I cut it down to like the most important 10 minutes here and the key info I didn't find anywhere else on the internet. So I was kind of thinking, okay, how how should we approach this understanding that, you know, he is the better player. Sometimes when you play a tournament, one thing that can be quite important is just your general confidence. And this is a genuine technique that even grandmasters use. Uh, what they sometimes do is they'll actually filter the database by the losses of that player. And then they like just look through all all the major mistakes that that player has been doing and the idea is just to sort of hammer home the fact that look this player like messes up all the time and you're like aware of how flawed your opponent is even if you're somewhat intimidated by them or if they're you respect their overall game that can be quite nice just from the point of view of confidence and this was awesome confidence was something for me that i really lacked i'm so shit. i'm so fucking shit at this fucking game so knowing that I'm playing people that are just like me was good news. So using that kind of framework for some inspiration, I did look through John's games and just tried to sort of identify what are some common mistakes that he's doing. John is, I feel he's actually quite a timid player. Sometimes he kind of tries to play conservatively to the point where he avoids being attacked. And when he does get attacked, he seems to kind of panic a little bit. So I looked at a couple of your games and stylistically, you are actually quite aggressive. You're a very aggressive player and i think you need to temper that aggression but at the same time it's going to be good because of the fact that i don't think that john likes being attacked this was great news all right so let's dive into the actual chess like basically we need a framework so that we can choose better like we can in a limited amount of time make on average better choices and that is cct uh, checks captures and the last one is threats at first you're going to be a bit slow but over time that'll speed up a little bit one of the big differentiators between more experienced chess players and less they're just very efficient at quickly narrowing down the amount of possible paths at every light turn you can also trade and take and take and if takes, I take, if takes, 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 queen h4, g3, knight g3, check, c6, queen b7, knight h1, king there. He's unguarded, right? So in theory, if I do this. Anyway, I already knew CCT. So next we went over some drills together, which was super helpful because if you watch all these videos online, they're fine for normal players, but for beginners, he highlighted some major pitfalls and gave me some great insight I didn't find elsewhere. Like here, take a look at this one. Pause the video and yourself use checks, captures, and threats to find the best move in this position. Okay, y'all good? That took way longer than it should have, but you know, it's fine, you're learning. So personally, I said, uh, could it be moving this pawn? Yeah, if you move this pawn up, mm -hmm. then you have two attacks on the bishop, mm -hmm. plus the bishop has no sightline to the rook. Very nice. Bishop e5, f6, cuts off the defense of the rook and hits the bishop. That's called a double attack. Double attacks in chess are the single most powerful tactical device. Have you ever seen any of John Bartholomew's kind of older videos? No. Now you found this move f6, it's an excellent move, but there's even better. Let's think of checks, captures, and threats once again for black. Does black have a check here? No. Does black have a capture? Uh, not a good one, I don't think. They could have, the, like, he could take that. Like, that's just losing an exchange, but is there any upside to it? Uh, the 
Rook is now not protected. Right, so in the transaction, black ends up. Up, I think so, yeah. Right. Yeah, because you basically, you both lose the Rook, mm -hmm. but you pick up an extra bishop. Did you catch that? Listen to the wording he used. Like, that's just losing an exchange. So in the transaction, black ends up. You see, the squirrel operating me has such a tiny peanut brain, he's not thinking in terms of transactions. Will I win a transaction? He's thinking only in one specific trade. And if you listen to John Bartholomew, who he references, he says this. If you can't describe a reason why a trade is at minimum neutral for you and preferably advantageous, then you have no business making that trade. So using CCT here, I would have had a framework to find the most advantageous transaction, but it revealed a few key issues for me. One being I'm pretty weak at the actual calculations behind trades and transactions, so I have some homework with John's videos. And two, despite knowing about CCT, I make critical errors with regards to my order of operations. So this is a nice example where it's like you actually found the thread. And this is a really good move. You found the strongest thread in the position, but you skipped over possible captures. So Alex deduced that either I'm skipping steps entirely or I'm going through it really fast and kind of doing a rush job. He summarizes that beautifully right here. You didn't look at all the possible checks. That's one mistake. The second mistake that you could make is that you look at it and you're like, ah, that's actually shit. And you move immediately towards like captures, but you forgot to look at all the possible checks. Alex explained that I'm probably a little bit slow and that I'm also probably a little bit stressed out about the time it takes to do a good job and about losing to time. And for that, he mentioned this. That's one thing that I would give as general advice. Try to be relatively disciplined with checks, captures, and threats. You're not going to be able to ask yourself consciously every single turn. And that would be too time consuming and too mentally exhausting. You know, those positions like this feels like an important decision. Think about checks, captures, threats, because you can afford to spend a little more time when the stakes are high, like F6 is actually an equal position, uh, while this move is actually like a winning position, right? So it can make a big difference. He even mentioned this, which I also kind of figured out on my own. Now, the next thing that we can talk about, because we don't see, we don't really have any checks or any captures. And one thing that's kind of important is to ask ourselves, do they have any like major checks or captures that they're threatening? Like he even used my favorite word, apparently. In other words, if it was their move, are we, you know, effed or not? Was this guy not a great coach or what? One thing I've noticed is John does have a little bit more understanding of what are called checkmating patterns, right? So in this position, if I remove this bishop from the board and it's your move as white, what would you play? Now I'm gonna have to hold the frame here because last time not all of you paused the video and my joke didn't land. You know who you are. Looking at checks, captures, and attacks, that. That's it, right? So you found the move nice and quick. This is what's called a checkmating pattern. What I'm gonna give you on chessable is going to be helpful to like build some understanding of checkmating patterns. And I'm gonna post all the homework Alex gave me, including chessable courses that I'm gonna use later on. Now we discussed a lot more, like what I'm personally doing wrong in games, visualization skills, and color complexes. But this section is long enough as it is, so you can watch the full video if you're interested. Link below. Final thing we discussed though, John. Alex came prepared, having studied all of John's games. And then he brought out statistical data, including something called openings tree, where Alex was able to tell me what John is most likely to play in response to every one of my moves. And knowing that, we knew exactly how to beat him. You know, you're gonna play I think you're going to play e4. This is what I recommend you do. Sure, yeah. And John is going to hit you with this move b6. That's the, what is that, fianchetto? Is that what they call it? Yeah, fianchetto. I, I found one way in which there's like a reasonably high probability that he might fall for the trick. So I'm going to show you the trick, but be warned it's a little advanced. Okay. Now, you can start off by developing either knight. Doesn't really matter. Let's say this one. Okay. Now, he does his usual. He hits your pawn. And now this is the way in which you might be able to catch him out. First of all, this is um... The only question remained, was Alex going to be right about this? And come away with a win? Or was John going to be unpredictable? And the chess mastermind that I know him to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
day eight. So I started with the chessable courses, and you know, it was a bit slow going at first. But I was starting to get the concepts, slowly. I also started practicing the intricacies of the Italian opening. You know, with my friend's suggestion and Alex's recommendation of using E4. I think you're gonna play E4. This is what I recommend you do. It was only natural I learned it. Now after literal hours of watching videos, practicing, doing courses and puzzles, I thought I should try out my new skills against the ultimate competitor, XQC. Boop, 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 boop. It, 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 it did. My brain's offline. And it started like any normal Italian game. And without hesitation, I popped out D4, triggering the Italian Gambit. I learned it from this video, and I knew if I pushed my knight to G5, that rook was mine. I'm coming for you. Felix checks me, I block him, and then put my blinders on, hard, pushing for that rook. Completely missing the obvious fork that's happening right here. Bing bang. Bing bang is right there, buddy. This was it, my keb rival who beat me down so bad in the past. I took his rook. Gotcha, bitch. Another check, and now it was on to the offensive. Check, capture, check, capture, check, and with one more look at the checklist, he can't go here, can't go here, can't go here. That is mate. And oh baby, was I proud of myself. It was now time to turn my new skills onto the world. And the results, they would speak for themselves. Okay, check. Check again. Check again. Check. Oh, man. That hamster was wiggling free from that squirrel's grasp. And I knew, with each win, he would come closer and closer to retaking full control. As I slowly gained my confidence back. So I queued up another game. <sighs> okay. Another loss, no big deal. Oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Yeah, I literally got one win, and then proceeded to have another complete mental breakdown again. With my elo ultimately falling to the dizzying height of 315, I called it a night. So after a full night's sleep, I got up and walked to the chess store to buy myself a physical book with puzzles in it. It really wasn't about the book at all. It was more about getting into that fresh Ottawa summer air and taking some time to reflect. I had John in my sights, and I would either beat him at chess, or chess would beat me. And when I got home, I hopped back on to chess.com. I first started to review last night's slide, and noticed a few things. First, if I played tired, tilted, or distracted, it was a recipe for a loss. So I was gonna have to be super disciplined about taking breaks and resetting the mental, especially if I strung a few losses together. The second thing I noticed was this. I would either spend way too much time calculating my moves, and yeah, I would have a higher accuracy, but I'd lose the game, or I would just stress out about time, move super quickly, and then blunder my pieces. Like, look at this. Here's a check. Takes, 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 game. That's, that's the game right there. What an absolute moron. So I noted I really needed to use Alex's advice when it came to CCT. You're not going to be able to ask yourself consciously every single turn. And that would be too time consuming. You know those positions like this feels like an important decision. Think about checks, captures, threats. With all this in mind, I went over a puzzle review session, tried out my new book a little bit, and was ready to grind back my elo. And slowly and surely, I was able to find wins. Like, look at this game right here. I used my knight and my queen to get a back rank checkmate. Just like the chessable courses taught me. Subsequently, in this game, I should have lost on time. Badly. But I just kept checking and checking and checking this guy. A 
and knew if I wedged him against the corner and put my queen right next to him, I would take the victory. And I did this with 0.9 seconds on the clock. I was buzzing after that win. I'm so sad I wasn't recording it. I literally ran through my apartment freaking out. And slowly and surely, after a full day, I got it back to 432. And I knew, with my final day, I might not be able to close that gap completely, but I could put a dent in it. Honed in, I started my final stretch. And after quite a few losses, I had to take a break. I told myself, this was it. If I fell anymore, I was done. Deleting all the footage, cutting my losses, never to play chess again. And with that, I queued up another game. I did exactly like I had trained for. E4. D5? What? That's not what I had practiced. And uh, no worries, my training had thought, you know, let's pop out this knight, possibly an attack here and defending the pawn. This was pretty good. Then I got my other knight out. For fuck's sakes. This was going pear-shaped in a hurry now. I'd never seen this before. So, you know what? I decided to retreat. And right after I did this, I knew it was a mistake. All my hopes of winning this game were going down so quickly. And I knew one of the tips that every chess YouTuber tells people was the exact same rhyme. Knights on the rim are only put there by fucking morons. At least now, though, I had an opening for my bishop. So, the Italian was back on the table. G5, here we come. Oh boy. Let's hear it, X. Bing, bang. Classic. Just like I had planned. Next, I pulled out CCT for my first time and put him in check. Then, check again into discovered check, picking up the bishop. Another CCT, I decided to go with a check. This was definitely a blunder because he totally could have grabbed it. But it's fine because he is 500 and didn't see it. What a moron. Then I literally repeated the check into discover check to grab that pawn. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. And after a quick night trade, wait a minute, is that, is that Tamash Plekanek? No, but it, it was definitely a check for sure, I knew that much. Then after a quick queen trade, I grabbed his knight and his rook, and he just quit. The hamster was free. It was saying I was playing like I was over 1,000 rated. And win after win after win came piling in. I couldn't believe it. I got my ELO to an all-time high of 584. And out of time for my challenge, I was ready to face John. So yet again, I ruined my day and got into a call. Well, well, well. How are you, young Jonathan? Uh, you know, business as usual. You seem like an eager beaver to do some gaming. No, I would never lie to you. So I am working on a video. Shocker. And boy, did the excuses start rolling in after that. I haven't played in a long time. By the end of 2023, I wanted to be a thousand rated, but I gave up six months into the year. So whenever I do play, I get the itch. Then I'll play like non-stop and then I'll have a really bad experience and then I won't play for like nine months. Yeah, I don't know what that's like. Have our fucking neck. But I was feeling more confident than ever and within moments, my time to shine was here. You ready? Oh, I'm ready. Wait, no, 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 I'm not playing black. I played black last time. I need consistency in the video, John. Nice. You're referencing a game we played like seven months ago. Uh-oh. He had me already. You see, in my training with Alex, we studied all of John's black openings. We knew how to beat him. I, I found one way in which there's like a reasonably high probability that he might fall for the trick. You can start off by developing either knight. Now he does his usual. He hits your pawn. So e6 now this move looks like you're just copying it now john here and most players here actually who play this they go bishop here so i think there's a very good chance he play like this now you can play this move now here's the first trick let's say that john takes your knight you take the bishop and he wins your pawn but 
White is winning. Why is white winning? Can you find the winning move? This pawn. Yes. And what's more, once you take that pawn... Oh, the rook. Now, of course, he might smell a rat and he might just not go for any of this. He did smell a rat. And John shut that down immediately. You're referencing a game we played like seven months ago. Yeah, well, I should have played... Wait, we played black last time. <laughs> what are you talking about? Okay. Okay. I knew, despite having memorized all the tricks and all his lines and how to beat him for black, I couldn't push any harder. And with that, my plan was out the window. How was I going to beat him now? I was going to have to fall back on my training. I knew I could still beat him. I had improved so much. And I knew he was flawed. Now, if he's your best friend, don't think of him as some infallible creature, right? C6. D5, just like I had practiced. Then I got my bishop out there, hitting the knight to the queen. Let's go back where you came from. Takes, takes, we're all even. And at this point, it got tense with neither of us saying a word. Until choosing to go, I'm wondering why. Now I never know. I think you love me. It reminds me that it's not so bad. It's not so bad. John, I have something to confess to you. What? Uh, you've actually been live on Twitch on Botez Live for the last 40 minutes. <laughs> nice. What do you think about this this call currently being viewed by like 6,000 people? Cool. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They never answered me. Probably too busy making highly engaging chess thumbnails. <laughs> <clears throat> After scaring the living crap out of John, I refocused on beating him at chess. I moved my bishop off the starting square to cover my knight, and followed suit by castling. We had quite the dynamic position. What is a dynamic position? Basically, it's a position when there's fire on the board, right? There's opportunities for both sides. John responded to me by advancing his queen, putting some pressure on me. Moving this knight here would be disastrous for me. But I stayed cool, capturing and removing the most immediate threat to that knight. John, son of a bitch. Then, I kicked that queen out of here. John tries to play conservatively to the point where he avoids being attacked, and when he does get attacked, he seems to kind of panic a little bit. We're okay, we're okay, we're okay. Sensing I was down on time, I figured I'd move my rook quickly, in case this file opened up, so I could put the clock on John while I thought about the next move. But leave it to John. I can move that piece too. This guy had an answer for everything. But with the same logic, I pushed this pawn up the pitch. Sensing he was queuing up some kind of queen double rook firing squad on this file, I moved my king off the back rank and got my bishop the heck out of the way. And in true John fashion, I'm not seeing enough movement. Jumping things up a bit. All of a sudden, we had a game. It was way more open now. And after John wasted his next move, I saw my opening. If I could somehow get my knight here, I could in theory snag this rook. And all the while, this bishop is helping keep that king kind of stuck in that back corner. I'm sure if I got that far, I could figure out a checkmating pattern. This thing was on. And did the insults ever start rolling in? Good inter -fan, if I've ever seen one. Ugh. I had his boys on the move, though. There was nothing he could do. I added pressure, creating another threat, but so did he. John was about to crack this position open. And after what felt like hours of calculations, I decided I was just going to retreat. Takes, takes, and takes. He had me. He was threatening my pieces all over the place. This was a nightmare. What was going on? The walls felt like they were closing in on me. Everything I had worked for, everything I had done, flashed before my eyes. The Journey my beginnings, where I studied openings and learned tactics. 
my strategy of building John into this larger-than-life villain when he really wasn't. You know, he didn't mock me when he was on the football team. He was one of the only people to encourage me to pursue video making. He wasn't bullying some kid with a deformity. He was sticking up for the only Indian kid in our grade when that guy was bullying him. Hell, John was vice president when I was class president. He got me my current job. He's been with me through thick and thin. But for this video, I had to make him into the bad guy. He had to be the villain so that I would care about chess more than anything in this world. So that I could make my ultimate sacrifice and come out the other end stronger than ever and pull off the ultimate. Gambit. But now, I had my back against the wall. And this next move would decide my fate and friendship with John forever. What was I to do? But fall back on CCT. Check. Absolutely brilliant move! I sacrificed the bishop for his queen, and I was up. I marched down the board, and sure, I blundered my rook, but who cares? And I had him on the ropes. You have me. The only enemy is the clock. As time would tick, I didn't know where to go. Would I be able to find it? The perfect move to checkmate John and become the greatest chess player of all time. I don't know what to do, John. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Play something. What the hell was that? I wanted to play something. I don't know, I didn't- I That's hilarious. <laughs> I f***ing hate this f***ing game. I actually never want to play chess again after tonight. <laughs> Guy plays the same opening thousand times, and then he plays me. He decides, ah, oh, he's gonna change it up. The whole thing's gonna be completely different. <laughs> That's why you want to play white so bad. Wait, you, you study my opening. <laughs> you studied my opening, then I can lose. John, I didn't study your openings. I had a IM go through all of your games and tell me what you're most likely to play and the best strategic maneuvers to beat you. <laughs> What a waste of time. And I put it all down to this. What a waste of fucking time is right. Jesus H. Murphy. <laughs> That's such a bad idea. I'm so bad at this game. <laughs> whatever whatever product this comes out to, you're gonna get a, a like and a comment and a subscription. Oh yeah, you're not uh, you're not subscribed? He calls himself my friend. How am I supposed to get to a hundred thousand subs if you're not gonna subscribe, John? Explain that one to me. Fuck me. That's all I have to say, John. I mean, I think that's the perfect ending. Now, I always have to close these videos out by talking about what we learned. You know, for one, we learned that some friends you hang on to for life. We learned that despite our ups and downs, with a little perseverance, some self-confidence, great friends, and dedication, you can pull yourself out of a rut and even see some progress. And most importantly, I learned that no matter whether you win or lose,
Salut, ça va? Ça va? Ouais, continue. Yes. Je cherche un, un trophée pour le chef. Un trophée? Ouais. Ok, on va aller au deuxième. Ok. The chess store will always sell you a trophy. Je vais aller au trophée tournoi. And you don't have to prove anything. Ouais. Ok. Yeah. Can't believe I got through that whole thing without mentioning Bobby Fischer.